throughout the day you are constantly being bombarded by sensory information. And there would be no way to make sense of it all if you were unable to streamline which elements of the sensory information was processed at particular times. For instance, in this picture, I can tell you to focus on this watchtower. Now if you're focused on this, the likelihood that you really can tell the details of this M that I just circled are very unlikely, even though that information is entering your retina. And so the reason that I highlight this is because the thalamus is important in looking at some elements of how this process takes place. And this is the thalamus outlined here. Because it's the site where all sensory information except for smell is processed before getting to the cortex, it helps to organize and filter information that is then processed by the cortex. It is also involved in regulating sleep-wake states. Now as a relay station for a massive amount of information, it isn't surprising that it is split into many subdivisions. So we're going to outline some of the important ones here. Sensory information from the body enters into the ventral posterior lateral nucleus before going on to the somatosensory cortex. Likewise, sensory information from your face enters the ventral posterior medial nucleus before also going right back to the somatosensory cortex. Now one way that you could easily remember this association is that for the VPM, you put makeup on your face. And then by default, you will remember that the VPL has to be for the body. And maybe you can even think like VPL, the L stands for legs. So that's just an easy association that you can make. The ventral lateral nucleus, or the VL, is thought of as the motor division of the thalamus. Now it receives input from both the basal ganglia as well as the cerebellum. It has outputs to the primary motor cortex as well as the premotor cortex. Now given this set of inputs and this set of outputs, it isn't surprising that this region of the thalamus is important for planning and for the coordination of movement. Now vision, this is my beautiful drawing of an eye, enters into the lateral geniculate body before projecting to the primary visual cortex, which is in the occipital lobe. And hearing, this is my ear, enters through the medial geniculate body through a very complicated pathway that involves the vestibular cochlear nerve and then projects to the primary auditory cortex, which is deep in the temporal lobe. Now, a good way to remember this one is that the L in lateral geniculate stands for light, right? So that's vision. And then the M in medial geniculate stands for music or hearing. It's time for a flash quiz, everyone. Now, how does leptin act on the hypothalamus and what behavioral effect does this cause? Leptin is a hormone secreted by adipose cells which inhibits the lateral area and activates the ventral medial area. Its activity in the hypothalamus leads to feelings of satiety. Basically, you feel full. Now, let's talk about the limbic system. This is probably one of my favorite systems in the brain. It refers to the connection between various areas of the brain that mediates one's emotions. This includes the cingulate gyrus, which we see right here, the amygdala, you can get also the hippocampus, mammillary bodies, fornix. All of these areas are important in the limbic system. Now, you can think of the limbic system as being responsible for driving all motivational behavior. If you think about anything you have ever wanted to do, right? Have sex with that girl or boy, eat, whatever it is. That feeling that drove you to or away from something was generated by the system. Now, one way to remember the functions of the limbic system is through what's known as the famous five F's. Those are feeding, fleeing, fighting, feeling, and since I was told to keep my lectures PG, we will substitute sex for the last F word, pun intended. So far, we've talked about dopamine as a neurotransmitter, but now I want to talk about the specific circuits or pathways that deliver dopamine to various parts of the brain 
and how it becomes relevant for specific symptoms and treatments. Overall, there are four main pathways that we are going to focus on. The mesocortical, the mesolimbic, the nigrostriatal, and the tuberoinfundibular. Let's start with the mesocortical pathway. This pathway sends dopamine from the ventral tegmental area to the cortex. Alterations in this pathway are implicated in the negative symptoms seen in schizophrenia, such as flat affect and limited speech. The next pathway I mentioned is the mesolimbic pathway. This sends dopamine to the limbic system. Now, some of the structures that we think about when we think about the limbic system are the nucleus accumbens, uh, this is one of the VTA's primary targets, uh, as well as the amygdala. Alterations usually manifest in hyperactivity and can lead to delusions and hallucinations. The therapeutic effects of antipsychotics are actually thought to be mediated through this pathway. The nigrostriatal pathway is one that you should be very familiar with because it is implicated in what neurological disease? The answer here is Parkinson's and it is very well known to develop due to a loss of substantia nigra dopaminergic neurons which innervate the striatum. We will talk more about this pathway in detail but for now you should think about it as responsible for the motor deficits that we see in Parkinson's disease. Lastly, the tuberoinfundibular pathway sends dopamine from the arcuate nucleus in the hypothalamus to the pituitary. This pathway is important because it regulates the release of prolactin. And uh, you should be aware that increased prolactin release can have a number of negative consequences such as gynecomastia, decreased libido, and sexual dysfunction. These are problems that you might not want to have. The cerebellum shown in this MRI means little brain in Latin. The cerebellum integrates sensory inputs from the brain and spinal cord and uses it to coordinate smooth motor movements. It is important to know that people with disorders in the cerebellum have problems with which two things? Balance and coordination. So let's take a look at a patient. David? I want you to lift this leg as high as you can and bring that heel right on the kneecap. Right on the kneecap and run it down the shin. Okay, can you do that one more time? High up, right on the kneecap and run it down the shin bone. Okay, and, and I want you to use your heel like that and run it back up. Okay, just go down for me and back up on the shin bone. Okay, good. Now you note that in the video, the patient has a lack of smooth linear movement. Another way this is often tested in the hospital is with the finger to nose test. Again, due to the cerebellum's function in coordinating movement, it is difficult for patients to touch the doctor's finger and then touch their own nose. Here we are looking down at the superior surface of the cerebellum. It's almost as if you had cut away the entire cerebral cortex. You can see the tectonuclei of the midbrain here, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now the cerebellum's anatomic divisions include the midline vermis. This mediates truncal coordination, the intermediate parts that mediate limb coordination, and the lateral parts that mediate voluntary motor planning of the extremities with the use of sensory information. The output from the cerebellar cortex is carried to the cerebellar nuclei via Purkinje cells. These are really important cell types that you hear about a lot in neuroscience. There are four nuclei in the cerebellum. The dentate nuclei receive input from the lateral cerebellar hemispheres. The emboliform and globose nuclei receive input from the intermediate hemispheres. And the fastigial nuclei receive input from the vermis. Now the mnemonic we've provided for Parkinson's is TRAP, which stands for tremor, cogwheel rigidity, akinesia, and postural instability. And that can manifest in a number of ways. One of them would be walking with a stooped back. Now although the diagnosis of Parkinson's is made clinically, there are some classic findings on autopsy, such as the depigmentation of the substantia nigra, 
That's what I showed you earlier. Under the microscope, however, you might also see Lewy bodies, and you can see those pictured here. Now, what are Lewy bodies made of? Lewy bodies are composed of alpha synuclein inclusions. Now, before we move on, let's think about the pathophysiology for a second to see if there's a way to understand this intuitively. We said the major problem in Parkinson is thought to be a lack of dopamine from the substantia nigra. And as we discussed, dopamine from the substantia nigra acts on the basal ganglia to facilitate motion, and it does this through activation of the direct pathway and inhibition of the indirect pathway. So it makes sense that a lack of dopamine would lead to problems in initiating motion. Now the basal ganglia is a very interesting system with functions that include motor control and habit formation. It can get a little complicated, but it is worth understanding because it provides real insight for diseases such as Parkinson's. Now the basal ganglia mediates descending motor systems. So deficits in the basal ganglia can produce either hyperkinetic or hypokinetic movement disorders. The basal ganglia consists of the caudate nucleus, the putamen, globus pallidus, and substantia nigra. There are some other terms you might hear when people talk about the basal ganglia. The first is the striatum, and this simply refers to the caudate and the putamen as a unit. And the second is the lentiform nucleus, which in turn refers to the putamen and globus pallidus as one unit. Now, as you remember, there are two pathways of the basal ganglia, the direct pathway, which facilitates movement, and the indirect pathway, which usually inhibits movement. The trick to remembering the complex interactions between these nuclei that we will speak about is to think back to a very basic mathematical principle, and that is that a negative times a negative equals a positive. And translating that to newer terms, it means that an inhibition of an inhibition equals excitation. So with this in mind, let's go through the pathways. Here's the diagram that you can find in your book. I put this here simply to remind you of the anatomical context for these circuits. However, I think it will be a lot easier to understand if I draw along with the circuits as we discuss them. The striatum, which as we just discussed, comprises what two structures? the putamen and the caudate. So the putamen and the caudate, which equals the striatum, receives excitatory stimuli from both the cortex as well as the substantia nigra. Some cells in the striatum have D1 receptors. These are the cells that are a part of the direct pathway. These D1 receptors are excited by the dopamine that is released from the substantia nigra. So that's right here. We'll draw a plus here to show that these cells are excited. These cells, in turn, inhibit the globus pallidus interna, or GPI. Now, the GPI normally inhibits the thalamus. So, right now what we have is an excitation of an inhibition, which is an inhibition, then an inhibition plus an inhibition, which is an excitation. And so this leads to excitation of the thalamus, which in turn excites the motor cortex. So, under the influence of dopamine, the direct pathway ends up exciting the thalamus and facilitating movement. Now let's talk about the indirect pathway. These neurons instead have D2 receptors and they send an inhibitory signal. So first, these neurons, which are here, inhibit the GPE. The GPE normally inhibits the STN, but now it can no longer inhibit the STN. This means that the STN, or subthalamic nucleus, is free to activate the GPI. Now, when the GPI is activated, it's able to perform its usual function, which is what? As we discussed, this is inhibition of the thalamus. Now, importantly, and I want you to get this, because dopamine acts on this pathway to inhibit the pathway, Dopamine release acts on this pathway to indirectly activate the thalamus. At the same time, it's also activating the direct pathway, which again leads to activation of the thalamus. Thus, dopamine signaling through both of these pathways leads to facilitation of movement 
through activation of the thalamus, which then activates the motor cortex. So very big picture, the direct pathway, right, we'll put D1 here for direct, usually acts to facilitate movement, while the D2 pathway normally acts to inhibit movement. Now, the way that dopamine release affects these circuits is that dopamine acts to excite this pathway while it acts to inhibit this pathway, right? A positive plus a positive equals a positive, which is excitation of movement, whereas a negative times a negative equals, again, a positive. So the effect of dopamine on both of these pathways is excitation or facilitation of movement. Like I said, it can be complicated, but just look at it a few times and it will come together. It is helpful to think of the overall effects of each pathway and then work backwards to the details of each connection, remembering that inhibition of an inhibitory neuron leads to activation, just like a negative times a negative equals a positive. Okay, that was a lot, so I think it's time for a flash quiz. A patient presents with difficulty making coordinated movement with her right hand. A lesion is found in the cerebellum. In which hemisphere would it be found? Now this should be a pretty easy one based on what we discussed. Remember that the cerebellar hemisphere mediates motor movements on the ipsilateral side because the pathways cross twice. They cross once through the superior cerebellar peduncle and then again through the pyramidal decussation. This is where the corticospinal tract also decussates in the medulla.